Good afternoon, it's Wednesday 12.15 and welcome to another programme of Unearthing after the Easter. I'm joined with Yasmin, our social media manager, who's always got some very interesting perspectives from a younger age than mine, which is always helpful. So thank you, Yasmin, so much for joining me today. Um, did you have a good Easter break? Let's start with that, because obviously lots of people were on holiday. Some of our clients were jetting off on sunnier climbs. But did you have a good Easter? Um, I did the autistic thing, didn't I? I found a new interest in binge watch the TV show, so I'm now on season six. <laughs> I started it like two weeks ago, and I'm on season six already. And it's an American show, so it's not six episodes a season, is it? It's like twenty. <laughs> so I've just been sitting there going, "Oh yeah, that's very good. More, please, more." <laughs> so was the weather not good for you then to be out and about, or were you just kind of just hooked? Do I look like the kind of person who goes outside? <laughs> I mean, it, it was fine. I had a lady keep coming around my garden and doing stuff and she kept saying come outside it's lovely weather and I was like watch against CIS go away <laughs> so you know um I missed the F1 because obviously there was a week off for that but it was fine <laughs> oh <laughs> Okay, well, it's good that you've pointed out the gardening, because the reason why we're talking about hobbies today is because apparently it's National Gardening Day on Sunday, is that right, you said, Sunday? Yeah. But but for the UK, not for anywhere for the UK, else. Yeah. Okay, so we were... We, we were thinking about this um, some weeks ago when Yasmin was going through the social calendar for the year about what kind of things would we want to think about um, particularly in relation to our mental health and well-being and obviously gardening is quite a big thing but Yasmin and I are at very different extremes aren't we with our view on gardening so I don't know who should go first you or me why, why do you not like gardening why should I like gardening <laughs> I'm not good at it I don't find it enjoyable um you know what, and what makes you think you're not good at it because I kill everything I, and I don't mean to I try really hard I try really really hard even to the fact that um in the Mother's Day sale in Tesco's I picked up those little plant cards for advice and I did the I did the coffee thing I did the coffee thing on my plants it's supposed to help nutrients I have now killed them all oops oh okay but I followed the instruction it just doesn't seem to work yeah and I try so hard I want to be one of those people who has a nice greenery in their house, has nice gardens and looks lovely. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. So didn't you start last year, though, doing a very small patch of the garden with you? were, I think you were trying to create sort of like a wild meadow for your photography. Yeah. So yeah. What, what was that like? Um, so I, I wanted kind of like a, a wild garden area promote bees and stuff it looks quite peaceful you don't have to do much to it you just leave it to do its own thing I thought that was maybe better because clearly I'm I'm too attentive I don't know <laughs> um and I it was hard work getting all the ground up obviously because um yeah. we had to do quite a few trips to the to the tip to get rid of the topsoil um yeah. and I, it, it took me a while to do it like I could only do like an hour a day so it took me it took me at least a week I would say to do it all and um, yeah. you you took photos from your little office going, look at her, she's outside, celebrate, tell the news, <laughs> um, you know. And I planted everything and I thought it was going really well. Um, nothing has grown, nothing looks like it's growing, it's just weeds and it's like, oh, okay. So I won't be, do I won't be doing that again. <laughs> so this is quite interesting because I think a lot of people are looking, you know, and I would stress this, Yasmin, an awful lot of people want a very instant or quick reaction for their hard work. And you did work incredibly hard on doing, as you say, the digging and the lifting. And we did so many trips to um, up and down the garden to get it, to then put it in the vehicles, to then take it to the tip and unload it. But I think what was really interesting is if you take a look periodically with gardening, you can begin to see that there is progress happening 
just not maybe in quite the way you envisage, but it is certainly happening. So I know for a fact that there is a lot of life happening in that area and they're not all weeds. I think you'd be very surprised. And of course it does be very dependent on the weather as well, doesn't it? And we have a lot yeah. of wind yeah. that dries things out but also a lot of wind that blows things and even snaps things. So I know some of my agapanthus have not really had a chance because they've just been snapped in half. Um, but you have had some success stories and I'm thinking more about the hydrangea plant. What did you do with that? The one that is now dead? No, the one that is very much alive and just beginning to do new shoots. Have you seen it? Is it in the garden or is it in the house? It's in the garden. Oh, no, I haven't seen it then. So Yasmin obviously has forgotten this bit, but she said to me one day, do you think um, if I went out and trimmed it, it would help? And I said, well, I don't really know oh. very much. And you did, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I deadheaded it at the yeah. start of the pandemic because I was like, yes. can't go anywhere got to do something outside um because i've already done my one walk of the day i can't go out again the police will come <laughs> you know um so i did that and I, I need to go out and do it again because it certainly looked better but i think yeah. that's quite a hardy plant and i think it's been at the house longer than i have so i don't think it would have been happy with me trying to remove it or kill it off <laughs> i think yeah, it was yeah, quite yeah. stubborn in that way <laughs> So what did you feel when you cut it? Did you feel a sense of satisfaction? Uh, not really. <laughs> I did it well, out of boredom. <laughs> okay, but did it did it manage to distract you from boredom? Not really. I think I, I think I was, um, you know, I was still thinking about stuff while I was doing it. I, it wasn't quite it's a chore I have to do it like I willingly did it but at the same time yeah. it wasn't something I'd rush out to do it again you know it's just something yeah. like okay I'll give it a try to see if it grows better because I quite like that plant but you know and and did it yeah it, it seems all right it, it's still thriving I yeah would say it quite liked having a trim back no yeah. it quite liked having a trim back didn't it, it came back even yeah. stronger and more colorful and bigger and bushier so I guess, you know, from from that perspective, that's where I can connect you, with you regarding gardening, because there's something really um, satisfying about, you know, I can see it has a need and I can see that if I do a little bit of pruning or, you know, um, looking after it, it will grow stronger and better and more colourful. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So there's a different there are different types of gardening is what I'm trying to convey to you that actually give you an immediate sense of satisfaction but also there are things that take a little bit longer. Um, from my perspective I suppose what I like noticing is over the years noticing what's growing, what's not growing so well but also trying to design sort of like how I would like my garden even if it's down to you know, we keep talking about having um, a summer house overlooking the view, but having somewhere nice to sit where you can mm -hmm. sit outside if you wanted to have a, a drink or a meal um, or just sit and write, just sit and relax. Um, and I know that there are certain things that it's a bit like moving house. Literally, you have to find the right place, the right home for somewhere to sit and plants are very similar but also garden furniture you kind of have to move things around until you find the best the best viewpoint for it so i quite like that but also the different types of flowers some things that you said you know you've you've killed them off yeah what i find is that there are some people who have an absolute art with say for example um orchids and i am really hit or miss absolutely hit or miss um, I know they adore sunlight, but they hate the cold. Um, but equally, there are other plants that have come up time and time again with unfailing regularity and stability, such as daffodils. Even though I thought all the bulbs had died originally, they clearly haven't. But I've learned in the process 
And I suppose with gardening, ultimately, it is a way of processing. Um, it, it can also be a distraction, but it's also a lovely way of learning about different things. And through gardening, my love of birds has also come about. Now, that is something that you have been successful yeah. with. So what have you achieved with that one? Um, I haven't pleased all the birds in the garden, clearly. Um, no. Okay. But, uh, again, at the start of the pandemic, I was like, I can't go out so much. So I got one of those... Um, see-through bird feeders that you stick on the window yeah and i i originally had it in my office because i thought that's a nice quiet area of the house that'll be fine but i didn't seem to get a lot of activity there so i instead put it on my bedroom window and at the start i didn't seem to get a lot of you know activity from it but i had a faux floral like ring that you normally put on like a wall or a door and i hung it on my window and that's kind of given the birds a sense of protection so they are more comfortable to come to my window and so now i'm regularly being woken up by birds banging on my window trying to fight over food wow okay so yeah. what kind of visitors have you got coming to your your bird feeder then see this thing i i can do the birds i just don't know what they're called so i have okay the... what colors have you got the little yellow ones with the blue the blue wings i've got two yeah. of those i thought there was just one there's yeah. two nice one shoved one out the other day Oof. over the suet log that was in there <laughs> and then i have a little black one but it's not like super little it's like that size um nice that one comes occasionally i do have some seagulls who try and come uh, they haven't figured out how to fit <laughs> Because obviously they can't put all their weight on it, so no. um, they try to hover. But yeah, you know. yeah. So does that kind of keep you distracted, or does that allow you to process while you're watching them? What does it do? Um. Well, to be fair, they normally come when I don't actually notice them, and then when I notice them, I'm like, oh, oh, that's nice. It fills me with like a little warmth, going, oh. They do, yeah. they do appreciate my little food station for them. That's nice. Um, and then I try to like sneak a little picture or a video of them there because it's like, oh, like, it's quite proud looking at that and going, oh, yeah. it is appreciated. Nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So again, through my gardening experience and I've learned about these different birds, it is very interesting. And I noticed that at John's house, um, he had quite a significant community of starlings but they seem to have waned now where they've gone wherever they need to go and when I was shuttling backwards and forth um, I was noticing that actually we had more starlings and yet we were sitting right on the coastline um, mm -hmm. which made it really interesting and one of the things that I set up very early to do with the garden was to build a higher thicker hedge so that one, it would provide more um, protection around the house because it does it because it's so exposed with the wind. But also, more importantly, if I could make the hedge taller, I could then trim it regularly so that it became thicker, and then it would provide a natural home for the birds. And that seems to have worked an absolute treat over the last few years because now we've got a very big um, selection of birds that visit our garden. Um, and it's really lovely to see where they like to spend a lot of their time. Mm. So I know that we've got starlings, um, a very big community of starlings. We have lots of blue tits and yellow tits. We have obviously our robin who, you know, constantly is sitting in and around our garden. But we also have quite a few blackbirds coming and visiting um, what I find also very interesting with um, John is he's got two jays in his back garden, um, but he's got an immediate dense forest area, whereas we don't have that. We're very exposed with fields. And obviously we have loads of seagulls who come and visit in the off chance. But I think as well, we are surrounded by fields. So we see a lot of pigeons and seagulls 
around the area because of course the farmers constantly are doing different things to the fields around us so we're seeing a lot of that and farming life again is an extension of what you and I have explored learning about the cattle and the lambs particularly the lambs you have a complete fascination with them don't you but there's always something going on isn't there in the farming world we're seeing always lots of things whether it's doing um growing um straw and hay and then having it cut or whether it's the sheep coming in and then the lambs coming you know or whether it's the cattle and they always move around don't they um i always find that really interesting to learn even more information and the thing is it would be very time consuming if we were reading it and i wouldn't have a lot of patience for learning about it through reading but visually everything comes to life doesn't it see um i unfortunately yeah i do i do have a, a small obsession with lambs and sheep i i i i really like them um so i actually follow a farmer on tiktok right who is a sheep farmer and so like he regularly does like videos of like what he's doing like you know educational videos and stuff so i now know that you know for example um you have to crop a lamb's tail within eight weeks after eight weeks if they still got their long tail it's actually illegal and it's very interesting because on the drive to tesco's in lambing season i've seen a couple of fields with illegal lambs in there so i'm guessing they're the same farmer because otherwise we've just got loads of farmers who've gone rules don't know what those are don't care <laughs> um you know um i now know what to look for if a sheep has actually had a miscarriage like uh, loads of things i wouldn't have known that if i hadn't had an interest in it and then kind of gone oh i'd like to look i'd like to know more oh there's a farmer on tiktok who does that and it's it's a very easy accessible thing now yeah yeah so already we've kind of moved from gardening to birds wildlife to farming on the land to now learning about things on tiktok so that's really quite impressive isn't it because we normally think of when we think about hobbies we normally think that they are just one singular activity, whereas in actual fact, we've already looked at what we do naturally within our home environment and how that has led us to learning a bit more about different things in a different way. And I think that's really, really interesting, you know, how about how for you and I, we are both autistic, so we get bored quite quickly, but somehow these things have maintained our interest perhaps in slightly different things, because of course, if you take the farming, some months it's about growing, you know, hay and straw, other months it's about sheep and lambing, and other months it's about cattle. But equally, you are then finding that interesting about the lambing, so you've gone and looked and investigated through TikTok. So we're learning in different ways, which is really powerful, but the point being, you're never getting bored, are you? No, um, I also think it's I, the reason why I like the hobby so much is because, you know, knowledge is power kind of thing. It's a really, really weird fact and I'm not going to really need it in life, but it's like, oh, that's interesting. So, you know, yeah. like I say, I think I'd be very good at a pub quiz because I just have lots of random <laughs> knowledge floating around up there. <laughs> Got to use it to good use for somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you think back over the last um, two years, you know, with COVID, we've had to learn to be very um, kind of creative, haven't we, with different kinds of hobbies. Um, so I suppose, you know, in that respect, where we live, you know, the farming didn't stop because of COVID. While, you know, the, the farm life had to be considered every day, day in, day out. And I know that the farm um, below us had to still milk their cows twice a day. The lorry still had to come and collect the milk every day. Um, you know, life went on pretty normally for them. Um, and that was of interest to watch as well. Um, apart from the fact that Monty would often try and escape to go and chase the wretched pheasants. So, of course, that kind of got us to know a few people around the area as well as the area to find that there were different places that we could walk, learning more about the wildlife or the farm farmyard animals. But 
What other activities did you find that you were doing because of lockdown? Were there any of real interest to you? Um, I think the thing is, I the older I get, the uh, the more I have learned that I am very easy to go oh that's an interesting hobby I'll start that and then I lose interest in it very quickly so like I was seeing people in lockdown on TikTok going I've started pottery and then next week they would be like oh no I didn't do pottery anymore I do crocheting and it's like I don't have the money to be able to drop all this money to to get a new hobby so um I kind of did things that I could do at home you know I I, I uh started my photography up again uh, I did some knitting for a while. My knitting's not great. I can't make jumpers. I can just about make blankets because they're one shape, <laughs> you know, yeah, but it, yeah. it, it was doing something, um, you know. Now I'm like, you know, I, I went to Aldi the other day and we got that um, crossword book. Not very good at it. It's probably going to take me about five years to complete it. But, you know, it, it's just like little things that you can kind of do during the day, isn't it, really? Hmm. I was thinking of kind of interesting hobbies that you took up. So, and I know this affected a lot of people over the first lockdown. It seemed that we had run out of hair dye. So all the shops ran out of yeah. it. And you couldn't get it for love nor money. It seemed really bizarre, but a lot of people had taken to dyeing their hair in lockdown which the first lockdown was um, initially thought of as being sort of like three weeks, two to three weeks, and obviously was considerably longer. Um, what did you do? Did you join in the hair dye race? Oh, she's frozen. <laughs> um, so I ended up finding hair dye to send to Yasmin to join us. Um, in the hope that she'll join us in a few minutes but it was quite interesting how um she was experimenting with colors like so many other people clearly were because you couldn't just order the normal colors you had to actually order um you know you, you struggled to or be able to order a variety of colors um and i know that yasmin took full opportunity of experimenting with the colors um but also we were thinking about lots of baking if you could get the right flour if you could get um sugar um things ran out very easily so you had to then be quite creative you're back <laughs> sorry i don't know what happened there my internet's gone again it's sorry <laughs> it's i was just talking about so I was just hair talking dye. about how you did a bit of experimenting with the hair dye and then we were thinking about lots of well, baking, you became quite creative with baking. Well, I, I, I went to Tesco's in the first lockdown and thought, um, let's get yeast. I can make my own bread. That didn't end up happening. I've now got loads of yeast in my cupboard, so we've been eating pizza quite a lot. So I'm like, I've got to use the yeast up before, <laughs> before something happens but i really thought yeah, yeah i'll make my own bread i won't need to buy any it'll be fine the hair dye i actually find quite interesting because i ended up having to dye my hair purple because i couldn't get my normal shade and i was like Ugh, my roots are coming in i've really got to do something about it but with my generation hair dye seems quite a big thing to try and fix your mental health it's always like oh i've just gone through a depression pit must dye my hair black or go bleach blonde or go red so everyone was going into the lockdown and i think what happened were there were three types of people the ones who already dye their hair and needed to update the second who thought oh i've got three weeks off school or i've got three weeks off work i'll do something jazzy and then the other one who went oh my god break down and just went i'm gonna do a new me <laughs> you know and then so everything kind of went off the shelves it was a bit ridiculous i had to have you send me some in the post because there was none in tesco's yeah and i was yeah. saying with the baking <laughs> because we had to be very creative with the baking as well um flour had run out we had to find different ways of doing baking without the most obvious um 
So the other thing, of course, yeah. as well, is yeah. that with the lockdown, we didn't have Easter and everybody had been thinking about Easter eggs. And so we were having to be very creative about, you know, how do you celebrate Easter by um, designing things, making things. And I suppose, you know, when you think about what do you do at home, you're having to be very creative about craft work. But there is actually a lot of people who love being very creative um, and doing a variety of crafts. And you've done that considerably. I think the latest one is um, the flower pressing, isn't it? Oh, she's gone again. I've lost her. Loser. Just when I wanted her to speak. It's typical, isn't it? Um, so one of the things that Yasmin's been really um, intrigued by, although she doesn't like gardening as such, she does enjoy um waiting for flowers till they're almost um dead and then um pressing them and seeing how they look um when they've been flattened um which has been extremely interesting learning what happens because some plants um the the color fades completely and it's just this lovely brown shell of a plant um or a flower um whereas others um, maintain their shape, maintain their colour, um, but obviously are squashed flat, but you can still see what it would look like, um, you know, when, as it is, even, it, even though it's dried out. Um, and other people, like when I was Yasmin's age, I used to dry flowers and I would hang them upside down. But again, some people make them into wreaths over doors or window frames. Um, or indeed have them as um, just a dried plant selection. So I guess what I'm trying to convey is, even though there are things that we have tried, there are lots of other things that we learn just by trying one thing, it can actually diversify into other things. And all the while we are being, um, distracted but also we are learning to build our knowledge build our experiences and find pleasure in learning about things and sometimes we find that we've got very little patience like Yasmin has absolutely zero patience with the gardening um, but is very happy to do dried flowers um, or to have things that are in pots on her windowsill um, whereas I much prefer going out and doing the gardening and seeing things develop over time. Now, obviously, we have a huge autistic following um, in relation to mental health. Um, oh, it looks like Yasmin's back. Let me see if she's back. You're back. I've got my laptop. I'm in a different room. Hopefully, internet's better. <laughs> Sorry, Mama. <laughs> That's okay. We were just talking about how, um, although you didn't like gardening, you'd gone across to sort of flower pressing and you'd been learning extensively how flowers um, cope when they're being pressed. Like some flowers lose their colour altogether and other flowers yeah. stay. And that's quite interesting. But also how it's interesting how we find ways of distracting ourselves and we learn so much more knowledge even though we move through a variety of hobbies even oh, you, yeah, know, you don't like the gardening but you're more than happy to flower press so you have to go yeah. out and get the flowers you know I think the reason why I like flower press though is because it goes along with scrapbooking and I like scrapbooking I like doing that because you know it's a bit yeah. creative, isn't it? I, I enjoy doing that. And scrapbooking is sort of like journaling, but I don't have to pressure myself into writing every day because that freaks yeah. me out. And I'm just like, oh, I've forgotten. Oh, no. Um, yeah. You know, but I think hobbies can kind of come from anywhere. Um, so when we've had the first lockdown, I watched a lot of Netflix. I started watching Drive to Survive and now two years later i regularly watch f1 and nobody can talk to me during the weekend so you know i suddenly i went from being really oh i've got no plans this weekend to it's f1 don't contact me unless it's important <laughs> or you going can you come over for dinner on sunday mm, race finishes at four so you're gonna have to wait <laughs> you know um 
it's fine. I was thinking as well, I mean, hobbies, hobbies are quite interesting because some are very much being able to be contained indoors, aren't they? And we have a huge autistic, you know, audience, really. Um, and a lot of young people, particularly the boys, but I can't say it's always the boys because I know that simply isn't true. But particularly a lot of the boys are really into their gaming, aren't they? Um, and gaming is a really interesting one because it can be all in, you know, all intense, can't it? Where, you know, you just absolutely, well, it's a bit like you with your F1, I think, you know, there, there's constant um, communication going on. There's always a running commentary of either getting really excited or shouting and, you know, really kind of buying into the experience. And, and clearly you're very um, engrossed in that hobby, particularly, and sometimes That's it can be taking up hours of your time and parents you know saying you need to get off that now and you're like no 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 five more minutes five more minutes five more minutes um what kind of gaming have you know experience have you had what kind of things have you gone through and tried uh so obviously i started off originally in the 2000s with my ds light in the nice Sky blue that I insisted I get back when they were only a hundred pounds. <laughs> um, and I started off that with like, you know, Nintendo dogs and stuff. And then um, I left it for a while. I was more into my, my reading and stuff. And then I started watching things online. I think YouTube was kind of like a really big restart of my love for video games. Um, so I had things like, you know, I started off really easy with like, you know, the Lego Harry Potter stuff. Um, and then I kind of moved on to like GTA and, you know, I tried Skyrim. I was really bad at it, but <laughs> I tried it and I enjoy it. And I still watch other people play um, on Twitch quite a lot. Like I'll, because it's, it's an atmosphere. Because even if you're not playing, watching other people playing, it, it's, yeah, yeah. it's kind of like, aren't you? Um, yeah, yeah. You just don't have the game over because you've died yeah <laughs> it's it saves me the embarrassment of having to restart every five minutes i'll just watch somebody else do it <laughs> yeah but but uh, interesting how um i mean uh, obviously gaming has really developed over the last 20 years hasn't it i mean we have so many games available to play um and I, I find it really interesting how there are some real fan favourites, you know, so like I've got um, lots of clients talking about Minecraft, Roadblocks, um, Pokemon is still a huge hit following. Um, but but it's really interesting how um, this is, a, it's not it's not obsessional, but it feels like it's verging on that, isn't it? Where there's just that real intense love of it and wanting to um, pursue the game of it. Um, and I, I suppose what I really like about it is there is something that really resonates with these young people who just really enjoy the game, but it's you know designed in a particular way. It looks in a particular fashion. Um, and when you think about Harry Potter, which is very visual for a lot of people, you know, there are even games around Harry Potter, aren't there? And, you know, it expands yeah. in different ways. And I know that from my age era, certainly, we didn't have those opportunities. Compute computers just weren't as versatile to think about those. But, you know, when you're thinking about children who were very hypermobile with their thumbs and fingers, it makes playing a game really easy, doesn't it? But there are other games, you know, such as, um, you know, the the classics, as I would call them, where you've got the monopolies, you've got chess, you've got, um, um, I don't know, um, playing cards, um, uh, Scrabble, all these. But some of these can obviously be diversified into um, computer um, sort of, you know, doing it on your phone and things like that. But but certainly there is something about that willingness to distract yourself in something that is a little bit different and still can be done either at home or away, particularly if you've got your phone with you. The other favourite I had doing as a child was playing Scrabble. 
uh, not Scrabble, sorry, plain jigsaws. And that allowed me to really think because I had to make sure I could recognize pieces. And although you started out doing jigsaws when you were much, much younger, these days you're not so much into that. Well, oh. I, I kind of cheat. You I like cheat? doing it with somebody else. Well, I don't mean cheat as in like, I, but I don't like doing jigsaws by myself because sometimes I'm like, oh, really don't get it. So I just leave it. Whereas if I'm doing it with somebody else, you've got like different pairs of eyes on you. So it's like, you yeah. know, it, it's easier. Um, and we don't have so much time to do it anymore, but I really want to do the Breakfast Club one that I bought because that one just looks really cool and it doesn't shut in the case properly, so I need to <laughs> yeah, yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you've got jigsaws online now, which are, I, I feel slightly easier. Um, you know, you don't have to have so much space yeah. um, to be able to do it. Uh, you could do it anywhere in the world as well. So, you know... Yeah. And all of these um, have the opportunity to be done together, don't they? Or singly, which is also quite interesting. What about the physical sports? Because we haven't talked about any of that other, I mean, gardening, I suppose, could be seen as a physical sport. But what about the physical sports? What kind of hobbies did you like doing? Do you remember? I'm not a sporty person. Um, we know that now. Sports, yes, we definitely know that now. Probably the wrong person for um, I mean, I know at school I had to do swimming, and everyone thought I was really good at swimming because I was the fastest. And it's like I'm not the fastest; I'm the tallest. So I reached the edge of the pool before you two. And everyone was like, "You must have trained really hard." And I'm like, "No, I've just got long arms. It's fine," <laughs> you know. Um, I did golf for a while. Golf was quite interesting. I quite liked that. Um, however, it wasn't so much the actual courses. I couldn't give a, you know, about the holes and stuff. I like going to the driving range. It's very therapeutic. I like that. I like the nice twack noise you make when you hit a golf. Lovely. Enjoyed that. But obviously I stopped that after a while. Um, I did gymnastics for a while, but too clumsy for that. And it got to a, a complicated point where we were doing like floor routines and my brain could just not remember all of the moves and I'm very uncoordinated <laughs> just, that kind of died a death um did netball for a bit but that was by force wasn't very good at that either uh you know so I, I've dabbled in a lot of things I'm just not great at uh many of them or if any of them <laughs> yeah yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, what I about think, ballet? You did a little bit of ballet. Yeah, I liked that. That was nice. I kind of wish I had continued that, but, mm -hmm. you know. The thing is, I, in hindsight, you can go, oh, I wish I continued that, but, like, you know, at the time, I was like, Oof. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of... Horse riding for a bit, that was... You know, um, I did the start programme for team gb rowing that was very good i liked that but i am very aware now i don't like water <laughs> which is a big issue um i could do land rowing but i feel like too many people look at you when you're doing that so i'm just not going to touch that with a barge pole um and i think uh, everyone thought i was going to be good at basketball as well i remember that everyone's like you're yeah. really tall you'll be great at basketball and it's like, I don't think you people know me very well because my hand-eye coordination is is not good. So I think in the entire school years, I only ever made one basket. <laughs> and I lived on that for the rest of the year because I was like, oh, my God, I actually I actually got it in. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, but it was when people were throwing balls at you and um, you were trying to grab them and it just went one way and your hand went the other and they went did you not see it coming and it's like yeah i was focusing really hard and i it went that way i went that way we did not meet <laughs> you know so I, I um at the end of it i just i kept having notes so i didn't have to do pe because i was just like i cannot do this it, it, i do not have enough you know i'm not spatially aware i'm not i, I just it's not for me it is not mm. for me <laughs> and what about cycling 
Do you like cycling? I like cute cycling, if that makes sense. You know, what's, my what's nice little Kensington bike. Well, oh, right. when you're on your nice little Kensington bike with your nice little basket and like maybe have a dog with you, it's fine. It's fine. But the lycra, the racing cycling where you're in the road of the cars, no, I don't. I, just, I don't like it as somebody in a car because it's like you're in my way. And I don't like the idea of being the person on the bicycle because I feel like I'd be angering cars and that stresses me out and gives me anxiety. <laughs> so um, I quite like doing a Sandra Bullock, though, in the proposal. You know, her little Sorry. bike in front of the TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that. That's fun. That's yeah. really fun because like, you can yeah. do other things while you're doing it. And a lot but of recently, F1 drivers I... kind of do that, don't they? They have yeah. a screen in front oh, of they them do and they're do doing that. that. They do sim on video games, which you can now do yourself, even if you're not a, you know, um, yeah. that's how much video games have evolved. There is now esports, which is just video games where uh, people just sit in front of a video version of an F1 car and drive. And there's genuine championships for it. Red Bull have now got um, an online team. They've got two new members who literally just do video game championships and they mm. win real money they win real trophies and it's, it's great you mm. know there's something now for everybody mm. um you know and i mean i recently started fitness with a hula hoop but it's, i was gonna say this is the new thing yeah. at the moment for you isn't it yeah i did not appreciate the judgmental look when you came into the sitting room while i was doing it because <laughs> that was a bit like she she looks like I'm doing something really weird. Um, but it's one of the link ones. You might need to explain it because it wasn't just a hula hoop, was it? It's a weighted hula hoop. Yeah. But it's got links so you can adjust it to your waist size. Because if you are, again, like me, uncoordinated, there is no chance in hell I'd be able to actually keep a hula hoop up. It would be falling every two seconds. So this one... Does the the movement of the hula hoop does the same exercise and workout as the hula hoop, but you don't have to worry about dropping it because it doesn't go anywhere. And um, right. I do thirty minutes a day, fifteen in one direction, fifteen in the other, and I watch an episode of TV while I do it. Um, although yeah. last night, Lily did try to jump and grab the weight, thinking it was a toy, <laughs> and then she really got smacked on the head with it. And I was like, "You're gonna hurt yourself," so I ended up shutting her out of the living room. Right, right. So walking the dogs then, that could be classed as another hobby, couldn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's loads of people. Um, I had a friend who said she doesn't like walking by herself. She mm -hmm. can't do it. But she loves going walking with her dogs and she'll go for hours, you know. And I, I have my dogs and I, I like walking them, but it gets to the point where sometimes they overwhelm me to the point it's it's stressful for me. And when I'm starting to get stressed, they start to get stressed. So it's not super pleasurable for me. But yeah. I like walking down to the beach because I can sit on the beach while they frolic in the sea and do their own thing. That's relaxing. That I don't mind. It's just when yeah. they're starting to get a bit too much. Yeah. Yeah. And I like walking as well with, um, I mean, it's been very challenging with Monty because at the moment, he just cannot be trusted off the lead. He's just so bird orientated. Um, and when he's on the lead, he pulls and pulls and pulls because he's just so desperate to get off the lead um, mm. because he wants to go and chase all these lovely pheasants that he thinks he can smell. Um, but one of the things that you and I both do quite a lot of when we're out walking is we often take photographs of the nature mm. around us um, or of the dogs. Um, and that seems quite a pleasurable activity as well or hobby depending on how you look at it um, with regards to that what about things like motorbikes or horse riding or I can't think uh, car racing or um, you know looking around transport museums I mean there's an awful lot of activities that are very much more physically orientated and um, you know and these these are interesting activities I think they can get quite expensive after a while you know if you're into skiing whether it's dry slope or going on holiday skiing you know on, on the traditionals but 
what kind of activities experiences do you think you've had with all of that because you know that they, they are quite um different aren't they with rather than just sitting in your cozy sitting room knitting away or flower pressing or doing gaming you know it's really different isn't it? it's very physical activity yeah, yeah. I also, I also think for driving, for example, it's very much an environment, you know, it, it's okay. a community environment. So you can go, even if you're just somebody who likes looking at the cars, you don't have to be super knowledgeable on the latest model of an Audi, whatever. You don't have to know all that. You can yeah, still yeah. just sit and appreciate and, you know, watch it. And I mean, I find it very interesting. Some people who say, oh no most sports isn't a sport it's just cars going around in circles and it's like have you have you watched something because you've been sat in the kitchen and i'm screaming away going oh my god what are you doing what are you playing at <laughs> you know and i enjoy it um and i think because it's a whole community and it's a whole environment even if you go to like an actual event You've got you've got the car noises, you've got the stands, you've got like food, you've just got all these senses kind of going on, and it's 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 a very involved sport. No mm. matter what part you play in the sport, whether mm. you're an actual athlete or if you're just a commentator or you're just a spectator, you know you, you're all kind of involved in your own little way. Yeah, I was thinking as well about um, we haven't talked about music, and music is a big arena for a lot of people with hobbies whether they're um, composing music whether they're um, playing instruments whether they're singing um, whether they're just going to the theatre to watch musicals um, music just does seem to be a big thing um, you know what's your experiences around that I think <clears throat> music is its own language it, it, it yeah. is totally it, it, it's 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 its own thing um you know again unfortunately i am not musically talented not gifted in that area but i i enjoy you know sometimes i i constantly have my headphones on and i'm listening to music and some of it might be you know naughty's pop or something um <laughs> you know but sometimes i like listening to classical stuff you know the thing is, with music, it's so big. There is always going to be a genre for no matter how you're feeling. That's yes. what I like about it. Yeah. Um, you know, and you you don't have to concentrate on the lyrics. You don't have to concentrate on the music video. You know, you could just sit on Spotify and just listen to whatever it is that comes up, you know. Yeah. And I find that really interesting. I mean, I haven't gone to see many musicals myself. I think I've only seen two. Right. Um, so obviously I've seen Hairspray after I saw the movie. Yes. Loved it. That was a great, you know, free ticket as well. So that that was a great night out for me. That was lovely. Um, I've seen Mamma Mia. Loved that. I would absolutely, you know, and they now hold a very special place in my heart because, you know, I, I do like those and I like the movies, you know. Um, but there's people who are like real theatre, musical theatre kind of addicts and they, they go to all these shows and they collect all the playbills and stuff yeah and it, again yeah. it's it's community i think that's the thing you can be into this hobby but when you have other people who are also very into it it kind of becomes part of your lifestyle mm. you, know, you get to talk to other people who are interested into it and I, yeah. I, I don't mean to go back to f1 but i can only talk so much about it to you whereas online i've got loads of people who really really like it or like the same team as i do and so you can talk to people about it like you know midway through the race you've got people going oh my god did you just see that and it's like yeah i did i'm watching it you know so i think <laughs> with musicals not only is there something for everybody whether you're into the singing and dance whether you're into just you know Agatha Christie on stage you know there's something there's something for everybody yeah and that's what makes it so amazing I think yeah I mean I was just thinking from um you know reading is such a big one um certainly from my generation of reading books and I've got all my Agatha Christie collection of Poirot and Miss Marple and 
you know, Tommy and Tuppence, um, you know, but but it but it, it's extended to seeing it on the videos. And so I've got all the videos and then it's extended to the plays. I've gone to see quite a few plays. You've come with me. But it's yeah. even gone on to your extension where you now participate regularly on an online chat room all about yeah. Poirot. And it's really quite fascinating because, of course, people around the world might be seeing a film crew like we did when we went to Dartmouth one day. We happened to see David Suchet, you know, acting in that. And it was really just mind blowing. Um, but equally, there are other people who have noted where they've gone to visit certain places that Agatha Christie visited herself to do writing in. And, and so you're connected with so many different people doing all of these. And from an autistic perspective, not having to meet these people in person, but being able to relate to them, like you say, in a chosen activity is really powerful. And I know when, you know, 50 years ago, when we were talking about people who were Asperger's and really into buses or trains and would, you know, note down all the numbers of the trains to go and watch them from the bridges so they could record all the numbers um, and would know, know really intricate details about all of these. There is that real obsessional interest, but it's been very knowledgeable and very specialist in those areas. And some of the activities I know have never died, but equally, there have been lots of activities that you and I have both tried. And although we've enjoyed doing them very much in the moment, it may have only lasted a very short period of time. So if you were to look back over your life, what do you think are the main activities or hobbies that you do now that have been long term compared to the short ones? Have you got any real long term hobbies that have stuck with you I mean you've got the basics like baking and you know painting I and I enjoy doing arts and crafts but um I'm not good at knitting but I really like doing it and I think the reason why I like doing it so much is you know I've got good memories with it and again I'm not I would never give it to somebody because it, it's always kind of like oh you made that did you and it's like yeah you can tell I've made it can't you it's, it, it's not professional it doesn't look good but it's very therapeutic I've got to focus on it um and I was thinking about it the other day actually I don't know how I got into knitting I mean I know I know we used to go to the the, the old lady group knitwits on a Thursday and I was the only 11 year old there um you know and I got there was all these older ladies going yeah I'll teach you how to do it and it's like oh you're left-handed okay well we'll find another way to do it and um so I've now got that skill and I've kind of taken it with me but I I, I don't know how I got there <laughs> I must have mentioned to you at some point oh I want to try that and you found me a group to try and help me with it um mm. And you would come with me. You weren't doing any knitting. You'd just sit there and have the coffee and cake. And I would be like, you know, doing this, you know. And now I'm still, uh, I'm still Facebook friends with the the original runner of the group, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. That's something that I will always look back to in my childhood and go, oh, I really like that. Um, and also I really like Agatha Christie's and I find it very interesting. I don't think I would have found her if it hadn't been for you because I remember my first kind of real memory of Poirot and Agatha Christie's entire universe really was we used to go back back in the old days <laughs> to the uh to the newspaper stand and you would buy your Agatha Christie magazine with the David Suchet DVD in there and now we've got the whole collection and I regularly go okay I'm going to bring down seven you pick one and we will work our way through <laughs> you yeah, know yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we've seen a couple on stage, but my absolute favourite has to be And Then There Were None because it was the first one that I figured it out for myself. Oh, I was like, yeah. I figured out who did it. And, you know, yeah. and I didn't need some, I didn't get to the end going, I'm still confused who did it or, oh, uh, you know, somebody else going, oh, nudge, nudge, it might be this. I was like, no, I figured it out. And then I got to the end and I was like, oh, I'm right. So now that one's always going to be kind of quite special yeah. to me like it's the yeah. first one that I, I did by myself I didn't need help or you know 
Um, so I love I love Agatha Christie now, and I've bought a couple of my own books, which you have kidnapped to add to your display, and it's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose what we've explored over the last hour is the fact that um, hobbies are really quite interesting, and they can be very short lasting, but also they can lead to other um, hobbies that have a shared underlying interest. So for example, although you like the garden, you don't like gardening, but you are more than happy to do a pot plant or dried flowers. Um, and certainly with the wildlife, that's definitely brought an interest right to your window. But equally, there are other interests that have had a real long standing interest. They are part of you and your interests. So, for example, baking um, or doing some sort of craft work. And I mean, you do a lot of photography for the M word now. So, we can see that every day that that interest has never died, even though it's been a particular interest for only half your life. Um, but there are also some interests that are that bring really good memories and that you enjoy doing even if you think you're not very good at doing them but they all are part of you and provide you with an interest of a way of distracting yourself of a way of preventing boredom and a way of um, preventing anxiety and low mood don't they because they're they're interesting to you what I would say is hobbies are kind of pieces of the jigsaw that make who you are, you know. Um, yeah. And because I've had so many hobbies, um, like I like to say, I am the queen of hobbies, but master of none. I, I'm not. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm fantastic at any of them, but you know, it means when I meet people, I'm more likely to have at least one thing in common with them because I've tried pretty much everything, you know. Um, and so I find it interesting when people meet me and uh, I, it's a bit derogatory sometimes when they go, wow, I've never met a girl with so many interesting hobbies. And it's like, well, maybe you're just not asking the right questions or something, you know, but it's like because I've done that and I've been able to experience different things, I, I will find something with somebody, you know, even if it's something small, like have you watched that movie or have you seen that TV series, you know? Okay, so there are two points I take from that. The first is, is it seen as an issue having um, experienced lots of hobbies when what I see is that you've diversified, you know, from the garden to flower pressing. You know, you still have the link, um, but in the process, you've become more knowledgeable. And two, you have found that rather than people saying, hi, how are you? Or what do you like about yourself? Or what do you do? There's a real instant connection with what are your hobbies? You know, what do you like doing? Because it's a persona of you, isn't it? So there is something very easy to talk about your particular interests. It's easy to talk about your interests, isn't it? Rather than having to think about, you know, what's the answer to you? Hi, how are you? How are you feeling? Or, you know, are you at school? What are you studying at school? Talking about your hobby, there's an instant, oh yeah, I can talk about that, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, um, so I started a conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago and they started off by saying, what do you do for work? And I'm like, oh, I really don't want to answer this question. <laughs> Not because I'm embarrassed of my job, but I just feel like, you know, it, it's my job. It's not very interesting. Um, and I'm still talking to this person now, but I 100% tell you, all of our conversation are F1 drivers, you know, related to motorsport of some sort, because that's easier, because it's when yeah. someone says, well, what do you do for work? And I go, I work in social media, or I work for a mental health company. And they always go, wow, that's so interesting. You must be so smart. And I'm just like, can we change the conversation, please? Because yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> so there's something really powerful isn't there about having a hobby whether there's lots of hobbies that you've tried or one hobby that you really are interested in and you can talk really passionately about and one of the things that I find really interesting is that 
um, for a lot of children and young people who don't like speaking, the question in the screening for autism is very much about, you know, when you get them on their subject, are they chatty? And it's like, yes. And it's something that's really easy to talk about. And I absolutely love it when we talk about our hobbies or interests because it's it's an extension of us. But it's so much easier to talk about, isn't it? Because like you and your friend, you've got that instant connection. You both like F1. You both have opinions on F1 and you can share your opinions, but also your differing opinions. You can talk about it from different perspectives. So already it's a very easy go to let's talk about something we both share an interest in. Jobs, you don't have the same interest. You know, so it's it's really difficult. Well, I also so, think with jobs, jobs, yeah, the outside yeah. everyone thinks it's uh, it's more interesting than it is, and I I don't I don't mean that in a way that my job's not interesting. It is, but when some it's even when you you know you're technically my boss, even when you go, oh wow, your job's so interesting, you must be so excited. I'm sat there going. We're looking at two different things. Okay. You know, if you if you want to feel excited for my job, go have at it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. As ever, yes, when we've run out of time, and I'm really grateful to you because we've managed to talk about an awful lot of hobbies, but hopefully that people who've been watching have got a real understanding that hobbies can be really powerful, can't they, to our mental health and well-being. And obviously, being autistic, we generally either fly through lots of different types or we have a particular interest. But either way, ultimately, our interests, our hobbies, our passions um, allow us to have something to talk about. And sometimes that is the only thing that we can talk about that connects us to other people, but is really helpful to our health and well-being. So... I'm really grateful to you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights to your your passions, your hobbies and interests. Have you got anything planned for us to talk about next week or are we going to be kind of going back to the drawing board and thinking? Um, um, I'll have to have a look at my diary. Back at the drawing board then. <laughs> Probably. Okay, well... Big thank you to those of you who've watched us. I hope you've enjoyed today's programme on thinking about hobbies. It's my pleasure as ever to have been able to offer this today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday, 12.15. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from Yasmin. <laughs>